Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In the last several episodes, we spent a fair bit of time talking about how to generate a data frame-like object, as well as how to get values out of a data frame-like object. Of course, the crowd is wise, and so uh, once I posted those videos, I got a couple bits of feedback that I would like to do a follow-up episode here to incorporate those. A couple things came up. One, uh, someone made a suggestion to how I was using a uh, data table to create the data table. Um, someone, or actually several people, <laughs> actually suggested I check out DuckDB. Also, uh, yesterday, I was listening to the R Weekly podcast. Yes, I know I'm a nerd. And they were talking about DuckDB. So it was already kind of on my mind. Uh, so I thought maybe I would check that out. And then um, there was a little bit of extra stuff that I did while I was exploring and learning about these tools that I want to share with you today. So over here in our studio, I of course have my benchmarking df.r script. If you want to get what I have here, go down below in the description and the show notes, and you will see a link to my repository for this phylotyper package on GitHub, where you can get exactly what I have as I've got it now. And then there's also a link for what it looks like at the end of the episode. To reorient ourselves, I'm loading a variety of different packages here, and I'm setting a seed. And the, the application that I'm working towards, honestly, I'm working towards this, is a package that will classify DNA sequences based on KMERS. I know that I want a KMER of about eight characters long, and so that would be something on the order of, say, four to the eight, which is about 65,000 units long. And that, um, and so for testing, I'm using 64 because that's a lot easier to work with. And that um, I'm also testing with 15 genera. In reality, I think my data set has probably about 4,000 genera in it as well. And then I'm setting uh, the cap on the number of sequences that have that KMER in that genus at 10. It's a random number. Again, I'm just trying to demonstrate things and do a little bit of benchmarking to see how these different methods compare to each other. And again, what happened was I tried to build a matrix that was 65,000 rows by 4,000 columns, and my computer started smoking. It was really horrible. And basically, I exhausted all the RAM on my computer, and R said, try again. And so that's what we've been spending, it feels like the last several weeks now, trying to do. And the latest iteration is thinking about how we can represent these data as a data table-like object. By the end of the last couple of episodes, my kind of sentiment was that let's roll with vectors. We could have three vectors to represent the sparse matrix, a vector for the row, the kmer, for the column, the genus, and then the value or the count, right? And that that seemed like it would work out to be a lot faster and more efficient, perhaps harder to program in, but probably better than using a data frame and certainly a tibble. So again, I want to try a couple of different methods. In this benchmarking script, I had a variety of different functions for growing a data frame um, using rbind, either as a data frame or as a tibble. We could also try it with a data table. Again, I'm kind of abusing some of these methods that they really weren't designed for these applications. Um, we talked about defining that the data frame or tibble exists and then populating it as we iterate through uh, however many observations. And, and my N for this ended up being something like 10,000 when I was testing it. So basically be like saying we had 10,000 sequences. Anyway, um, and then the next approach was to pre-allocate. So we create the data frame, we say how many rows and how many columns there are, and then we fill in those pre-allocated values. That ended up working better than growing it for sure. And then finally, I had a variety of methods here looking at data frames, tibbles and data tables where I defined the vectors and then I use those vectors to define the object, the data frame like object um, that worked really well. And then as comparison, I created a list. I also created the vectors. And then I also went back and tried it with the matrix based approach, knowing that for some sizes, the matrix based approach would cause my computer uh, to blow up. And then we also talked about various sparse matrices um, and representations that are baked into base R. Finally, I did have some C++ code to generate data frames. I think that performed about as well as everything else. Um, I, I guess in this case, actually, I used an N of 100. I'm going to go ahead and load all this stuff because I'm kind of sick of not loading it and getting that error message. So that loads, and then we can go ahead and run the benchmarking, and I'll show you what it looks like for building a matrix with 100 sequences. So that ran through, and again, like we saw last time, 
defining a vector or a list of vectors performed the fastest, followed by a matrix. Of course, the matrix is a bit hypothetical because my computer can't handle the size of matrix we need. Um, but then, again, these other predefined approaches to defining a matrix worked really well. Um, and so at, at this point, at least, it seemed like data table, data frame, um, if I was going to go with this type of re rectangular representation of the data would have been the way to go. Tibbles are really easy to work with, but are just horribly slow. Um, and certainly if you're trying to grow something, it's going to take forever. Um, and then we also saw in here some of the sparse matrices that behave like a normal matrix and kind of how you interact with them but building the matrix was certainly slow. Now, this is one component of the problem, right? This is building the structure. The other component is getting the data out of the structure. And so something like a sparse matrix might be really slow to build, but if I only have to build it once, um, then who cares, <laughs> right? Um, if it's really fast to get the data out of it. And so that was the other side of the coin. But before I do that, there was a suggestion that came in that my uh, creation of the data table wasn't really um, how the data table folks suggest you do things. And so I'm going to go ahead and modify that. And maybe this will be, I'll call this original. And then I will have an, an updated version I'll call set. And in here, the, the syntax is going to be fairly similar, but it'll be set df comma i. Uh, let me move that pop up. All right. And so it's data frame, the row, and then the columns. And so the columns are going to be one through three, not four, one through three. And then we assign it the list, right? And so this is the syntax that is recommended. Um, I'll go ahead and remove this. Let me run this to make sure it works on one iteration. And uh, with DF, sure enough, that works great. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and add this to my rig. Uh, for testing, and I'll make sure I've got these two functions loaded. Uh, let's scroll down here, right? So here was where I had it entered. So one of these I'm going to put to be orig, and one of them I'll put to be set. And I'll go ahead and run this and see if there's a difference in the performance. So that completed running, and here is my original, and here is using the set. Um, and what you'll find <laughs> is that it's about 10 times faster to use that set construct as the viewer recommended. So thank you very much for making that suggestion. Um, and if you're going to update individual rows in a data table, be sure that you use the set function. Again, that's with the data.table package. Um, and that makes it quite a bit faster. Um, and that actually makes it of the various approaches using uh, the index, actually the fastest of the approaches, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, and it's still not as fast as predefining those. But if you don't have your vector a priori that you're going to use to populate your data table, I would say that using that set is the way to go. So in the last episode, then, we talked about getting values out of a data frame-like object. And here I created data frames that were a 1,000 sequences long. And I created a whole bunch of different data frame-like objects. And then I had probably like 18 or so different functions for either getting one camera value out or three camera values out by a variety of different approaches. And so those are all here. I'm going to go ahead and load all of these um, and we'll see how those compared to refresh our memory. So as I ran this, something that occurs to me is that a thousand is pretty small. It runs pretty quickly, but um, we'd like it to be a bit more realistic. So thinking about what might be a more realistic value of n, if we have 65,000 possible k-mers times, say, 5,000 genera, that gives us 3.25 times 10 to the 8 combinations. And we know that most of those combinations are going to be zeros and not show up in our data frame. And so if we did, the, say, times 0.01 to get 1%, that is going to give us about 3 million. So why don't we go ahead and for now, let's do 1e to the 6. This will give us 1e to the 6 combinations of k-mers and genera. And so why don't I go ahead and rerun this benchmarking. So that completed running. What I find, of course, is that using a full matrix was the fastest approach. It's really not fair, but it's a good reference point, right? And then the next was getting a sparse matrix. And what's interesting to me here is that 
using three, looking for three values was actually faster than looking for one value out of a sparse matrix. This also creates an interesting trade-off because um, the sparse matrix was the slowest of all the data frames to generate by a lot. <laughs> uh, most of the time I spent waiting was waiting for it to build that sparse matrix for me. And so that it's you know, maybe 10 times faster than the next most you know likely method uh, gives me some pause to think, right? Maybe I'm willing to wait for that thing to build um, if it's gonna be so fast to get the values out. Then we have um, looking at a data table, data.table object re removing a single value. Um, it's interesting that data table three um, is farther up here. It's actually, you know, nine times, eight times slower than getting one value out to get three values out. That seems a little bit odd, and that's something we're gonna come back to. Another thing that sticks out to me is uh, lines 11 and 12 here, the which and the, the vector. So the vector was giving our vectors a logical vector of trues and falses of which rows to return, which values to return, whereas the which says which indices to return. And we're gonna come back to that as well. And then was, as we saw previously, using tibbles and um, bigger data frames really tended to, to slow things down a bit. So with the smaller size data set, I hadn't noticed some of these relationships. Previously, the git vector three or was faster than the git which three, which is where? Git which single, git which three here, right? And so here we see git which three is faster than git vector three or. Um, and we also see that git which single is faster than git vector single, right? And so the difference between these different uh, functions, um, I'll show you here. And, and the main difference is what we're putting into the vector to return values. So with the or approach, we're basically returning this, right? So we're, we're, assign we're creating this logical vector and then indexing that in to our other vectors. With the which function, we're returning the indices, right? So if I were to say create a vector, so if I do x one colon 10, right? So that's x, and then I do x equals equals two, that tells me which of these values are true, and I get back a vector. I can then wrap that in which x equals equals two, and that will return the index two. And so what's happening in these types of conditions is that this creates a vector, right? And so that vector then, if we insert it into uh, lines 318 through 320 here or something like that, is again looking through all of the values in the vector. And so, you know, when you only have a thousand rows, maybe that's not a big deal, but if you have a million or 10 million, then that starts to add up. However, if you're using the which, then you're returning the index, the seat in the vector that you're interested in. And so that makes access to these vectors a lot faster. The other thing that yeah, isn't a huge deal, but is also helpful, is that the output of which is much shorter <laughs> than the full vector. And so that means uh, you're not storing as much memory. So that's, that's an interesting result that kind of slipped my notice last time because we were using smaller, um, smaller vectors, smaller data sets, right? And so I want to come back here and see um, where else I am using which, or could be using which, right? So this is a case where I could use which, but I have single which. Um, this is kind of what we we're already comparing it back to. Uh, the get data table, I could put a which in here, uh, and that should speed this up a, a fair amount, um, as well as here, right? And so you can't use which with filter with a tibble. Um, right, so that doesn't work there either or here. Um, again, this is the matrix, so it's not going to work there, nor for the sparse stuff. Um, get vector single um, is going to be, um, and I'm confusing myself because um, I can actually use which back here with the DF. So I'll do which uh, DF kmer 20, and then down here with the get DF3, which here as well. All right, and then we have get DT single. Yeah, so okay, good, good, good. And so then we come back here, and then the vector approaches, we could, the singles, the ors, the ins, um, the lang, and then the which, right? Okay, so let me go ahead and rerun these, and let's see if anything 
changes radically. I don't think it'll change it that much, but hey, that's why we run the experiment and that's how we learn. So I went ahead and copied the previous results into a file that I've got up here in my untitled one uh, to compare to the output that I had here. And again, the, the fastest two were for the full matrix and then the sparse, so that didn't change. And then I had git which single, which now was faster than uh, the git dt single, single. so that, um, I guess they're about the same speed. And the df single, um, you can see here, um, got quite a bit faster, right? So using the which certainly makes things faster, not just for vectors, but also for getting access into data frames. So that's pretty cool. Again, my takeaway at this point is that sparse is certainly something to be looking at because getting access to those values is really fast, um, followed by using which <laughs> um, around any kind of logic so that we're converting that long logical vector to a shorter uh, ve vector of integers that we can then use to directly index into our data frame or into our vectors. So as I was looking through the documentation for the data.table set function, one of the things I noticed was that data.table has a way to get access to rows using what are called keys. Uh, they also have indices, which are kind of like keys, but a key um, you can think of as being like, I'm gonna date myself. You can think of it as being like a phone book or a dictionary, like a paper thing, right? Where you could go to the dictionary, you can look for the word like time and then find the definition for that word, right? Um, usually the keys and the values have a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence, right? Usually you don't have multiple keys for the same value or multiple keys for multiple values. Um, that's usually not the way it works. Usually you have one key pointing to one value. But with a data.table, you can have multiple identical, you can have keys that are redundant, right? Um, and so what is nice about that then is that if the data.table can store those keys, it'll make it a lot easier to get access into the data.table to pull out whatever key you want. And so what I'm thinking then is that we could make our KMERS keys. And so then if I say I want KMER 20, then it'll remove uh, all those rows that have that key. So there's a little bit of work we have to do up front to get it to work, but um, we can do it without too much trouble. So what I'm gonna do is make a copy of my data table. And so I'll call it DT2, and I will then do copy DT. So you need to use the copy function to make what's called a deep copy. That's like a full unique copy. I can then set the key for DT2 using the Kmer column, right? If we now look at DT2, we see that it's actually sorted, where if we looked at DT, it's not sorted on Kmer, but again, DT2 is, right? And so what we can then do would be to do, say, like DT2, and we can then give it square braces, and then period parenthesis, and do 20, and this will return all of the rows where Kmer is 20. And if I wanted to get back multiple rows, I could do say 50, right? So I noticed that this didn't work the way I thought it would. And I think what I need to do inside of these parentheses is to give it the vector 20 and 50. And then that behaves much better before it was creating an extra column with that 50. And so now what we see is that we're getting back a data frame, data table, that's got both those 20s and 50s. All right, so let's go ahead and using DT2, um, let's go ahead and repeat these two functions, the DT single and the DT three. And I'm gonna go ahead and put on this the key K uh, to indicate that it's got the keys, right? And we'll use DT two for these. And then in here, we can then do the period parenthesis 20. And again, I don't need to say Kmer equals equals 20 because it's keying on um, the key, right? And so back here then, we can do the same type of thing where we do the the dot parentheses with the C function as I saw down in the console, 20, 50, um, and 30. I have these in a bit different order, but it doesn't matter. Uh, confirming that that all works, um, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, and so now let's go ahead and load these. And then I'm gonna come back down to my testing setup down here. And let's go ahead and we've got uh, DT single, uh, and we're gonna put a K at the end of that. And then DT3, we'll again copy that and put a K at the end of that. I'm gonna run it and see how those compare. Very good. And so now I see that using the keyed 
uh, data table, that that is now much faster than what we had before. Uh, again, here was the DT single that I had before, and here is the DT single with the K. It's about three times faster with the keyed than with the unkeyed, uh, and getting three values out, um, let's see, where's DT3? Right here. Um, yeah, that's right there. That's like almost eight times faster uh, with the keying, right? So definitely using the keyed index to get the rows out that we want um, really speeds things up for the data table. So that's pretty cool. Um, and that's something, again, to keep in mind if we're going to be doing a lot of these types of filterings. So the next thing that I want to talk about is using DuckDB. And so this is something, like I said, I hadn't heard about until yesterday when I was listening to a podcast, driving around in my car, and then I checked the comments to the video that I posted and people were asking about DuckDB. How did that compare? And so I was like, wow, it's all like the world is trying to tell me something here. So let's go about seeing if we can use DuckDB. So DuckDB is a improved uh, speed and storage and all sorts of things for a database. And so a database tends to be optimized for the application that it's being used for. And so um, there's some great videos from rconf and positconf about DuckDB that I would encourage you to go check out here on YouTube. I'm going to give you the basic introduction to DuckDB and um, there's two general approaches that you can use to get access to the database structure of DuckDB. So one is straight up the DuckDB R package, and then there's also the DuckDB uh, Duck, Duck Plier package, which is basically dplyr, but instead of working with tibbles, it works with DuckDB. And so I'd like to quickly here in the remaining time compare those for doing this filter-based approach, and if that works pretty well, then maybe we'll come back and we'll try it with uh, some more sophisticated analysis. So what I will do is go ahead and we're going to come back up to the top here and do library duck db and library duck plier. I already have these installed. I have to admit I was playing with them a little bit um, already. So we'll go ahead, um, come back down to our code. One of the things to know about duck plier, <laughs> ah, all these pliers, is that they don't have all of the verbs that you will see in dplyr. And so if it doesn't have a verb in duck plier, then it will revert to the dplyr version of that. Those will tend to be slower. And so you kind of have to be a little bit careful, I've learned, with which verbs you're using so that you're getting the optimal performance. But before we get to DuckPlayer, let's worry about DuckDB as the R package itself. So I haven't done a lot with relational databases, but DuckDB is a relational database like SQL, uh, like SQLite and Postgres or all those different things. Again, I haven't done a lot with those. So there's a package in R called DBI, all caps, and this is a package that gives you access to different databases using R. And so I'm gonna start there. I'll start with creating a variable called con for connection, and then we'll do db connect, and then we'll do duck db as its own function, right? And so this creates a connection to duck db. Uh, that's with, if you're using duck db straight up, that's what you have to do. The next step then would be db write table. And here what we'll do is we'll give it the connection, and then in quotes, the name of the table. And so I'm gonna go ahead and call this a duck. <laughs> and what we're going to assign to duck, I'm gonna give it df. So it's gonna take a data frame that I already have existing and it's gonna convert it, it's gonna write it as a duck table. And so now I have a connection to this duck DB database that is a data frame, okay? So when using the DBI interface, you now have to write SQL code. And so I don't know a lot of SQL code, so what I'm gonna show you is really the basis of a fair amount of Google searching, <laughs> just to be totally honest with you. And so I will go ahead and put this here um, after the, tape, the tibbles. So to get the rows out of the database that I want, I'm gonna have to do db get query, right? And so now I'm gonna give it con for the connection, and now I have to get SQL code, right? <laughs> so this is where it might get a little bit scary. So we can do select, all caps. Some of this should look familiar to what you're used to seeing from uh, say like dplyr, right? And then star will get all rows from, uh, and then we'll give it duck as the name of the table. 
This then returns all rows, all columns from duck, and I can then say where kmer equals equals 20. This now returns all the rows where they're 20, right? I'll call this get dbi single function, right? And wrap that in my curly braces, and we're good there. I'll make sure that's loaded, and then I'll do three, all right? And then we'll do or kmer equals equals 30, or kmer equals equals 50, right? Again, running that, make sure that it all looks good. We're in good shape, okay? So that's our get dbi single and three. I'm gonna come back down here, and I'll go ahead and add to this get dbi single, Oh, it needs dbi, and then get dbi three here. We'll run that and we'll see how the duck db version compares to everything else we've been working with. So of course, I now have 21 <laughs> different tests. And so I'm gonna add to the end of my pipeline here, print n equals inf. Um, I won't run that just right now, but for right now I can do dot last value um, and pipe that. Uh, to print uh, n equals inf to get all everything showing. And so again, what we're interested in is our duck, our DBI. So there's one DBI here, and then here's another DBI here, right? And so we can see the single does pretty well compared to data table uh, without indexing, certainly better than a data frame, um, but it's not as performant as uh, data table with, with the keyed access. And again, this is one aspect <laughs> of using a data frame is, is filtering, right? There's there's lots of other considerations um, that we've already talked about, right? I think where DuckDB probably shines is doing more manipulations, things like group by, summarize, adding columns, things like that. But for this application, I wanna say it, it does pretty well, um, but you know perhaps not as well as a data table with keyed access to those rows. So this is using the DBI interface using the DuckDB package. Um, the other approach that we could use is the Duck Plier, you know, the Duck Plier package. And so let's see if that performs any differently. My understanding is that the Duck Plier package interfaces directly with the DuckDB code, the, the C++ code under the hood, ver rather than going through an intermediary like DBI. So let's see if duck plier is actually any faster than what we might be able to get using the duck db package. I'll go ahead and do duck equals as duck dplyr df, right? And so this is a helper function that will convert my data frame into a duck database uh, file. Uh, and if I look at duck, I now see um, a whole bunch of information actually, right? Um, it tells us all sorts of stuff about the, the table, right? And what's in it, as well as showing us what's there. So that's, that's pretty slick. And now it should be basically plug and play where I can take my tibble based stuff where I used filter, right? So like these two functions here, and instead of TBL, I'll put duck uh, and I'll kind of copy and paste duck throughout here. Right, and so now if I do filter with duck, um, I see that I get back that, so that's cool. And then if I do it with these three kmers, um, I, I see those as well. So let's go ahead and run these, and let's come down here and get them inserted into my micro benchmark stuff. Um, and so I will call this duck, and then we'll also do um, the tibble down here, so the duck here. Let's run this and see how things compare. So we have the DBI single in three here, and then we have the single in three here for duck. Um, a bit slower, um, quite a bit slower actually than the DBI, which kind of surprises me. Um, not totally sure what that's about. One thing I want to check is if um, get duck single gave me any messages. It, let's kind of scroll back up here. Uh, my understanding from the documentation is that it'll tell you something um, in this output if it reverts to using dplyr. It's not, um, it doesn't appear. So um, yeah, so it's interesting that duck is running slower than using dbi. Of course, the dbi 
um, as we've been saying, the interface is not very pleasant, right? Like the whole process of having to write out SQL code is a little bit overwhelming um, versus having um, duck plier do the conversion of the dplyr code into SQL for you. Um, and so maybe there's a little bit of a performance change there. Before we end, one thing I would like to do is go ahead and increase our n a bit. And so let's come back up to the top, remind myself what it was. And so I had 1 million. Why don't we take it up another order of magnitude and I'm gonna go ahead and run, rerun everything and see how much that impacts the order of my different functions. So that finished running. And one of the things I noticed with 10 to the seven um, is that the duck version <laughs> um, actually now is faster than the DBI version. They kind of flipped positions. Um, and again, not nearly as fast as DT with the keys, but it's in between what we had before. And I, this is up at top is what we had before with 10 to the six. Um, and so now, um, again, down here where we had uh, these two DTs for a single and uh, three, <laughs> uh, we now have the duck versions in the middle. And so that's, that's pretty cool. Again, getting the rows out of the data frame type object is one component. <laughs> um, and I am still really intrigued by this fact that, um, that, that the, the sparse matrix seems to be performing so well. Of course, the way I'm using it, the sparse matrix isn't really all that sparse. And so um, it's a pretty full matrix actually. And so um, I wonder if that is perhaps affecting its performance a little bit. To add the sparsity into the data frame, I'm gonna come back up to my top here where I had n kmers, n genera, and my n. And my n kmers, again, is gonna be four to the eight. That's like 65,000. Uh, the number of genera, I'm gonna go ahead and put at 4,000. And then my n, again, that's a count. Um, that will be um, 10, that's, that's a good number. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and make sure these are all loaded. And then what we'll do is come back down here where we are creating the different types of data frames. Um, again, we're gonna run with that 10 to the seven. So generation of that sparse matrix before was using matrix sparse T. Um, there's two other approaches as well. This was also taking a very long time to run. So I think what I'm going to do is come back up here to my getters or my, my makers, right? And so I had uh, matrix sparse C, R, and T. And there's actually, I've learned a faster way to do this. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this down and modify that. And I'll then make this to be old so I can compare the timings. And let's get some more real estate here. So again, that was matrix sparse C. And so what we can do is after we define kmer, genus, and count, is I can go in here and I can then do sparse matrix and I can give it I, J, and X. So I will be the vector that defines the rows, J, the columns, and X, the values, right? And so my rows are gonna be kmer, J is gonna be genus, and X is gonna be count. And then there's REPR, so that's the representation. And it's gonna be a C, R, or a T. So this is C, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and um, I can remove that M. Uh, so I'll load that. And then I'm going to make this the old one for the R. And I'll copy this down below it to give us um, an R version that's new. And that's gonna then replace this R. And then also this sparse T will also be old. And then here we'll plop in again, this updated code with the T. And then this representation will be a T. I'll go ahead and reload all this to make sure those functions are loaded because we've seen me think they're loaded and then they're not. All right, so that's cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and benchmark this with an N of 100, even though the actual application we're gonna want is 10 to the seven, because if I do 10 to the seven, then even if I kind of just winnow down to the things where I'm predefining the vectors, it's gonna take forever. So we'll go ahead and run this and see what we get comparing generation of those sparse matrices. So that ran through, and of course I now have over 20 different options, so it didn't print them all out. Uh, I can do the trick with last value, uh, print n equals inf. Should go ahead and add that to my actual pipeline. So what we're looking for, of course, are these new uh, constructors, builders of the uh, sparse matrices. We see they're quite a bit faster uh, than what I was doing before. So um, I will <laughs> gladly do that. Um, and so we'll come back down here to our code 
or with setting up the getters. I've got three different sparse options. I don't know which one is the fastest for getting access. I've been using T because what we saw before was I believe that the T was the fastest for building uh, the matrix. But I don't know that it's the fastest for getting the values out, right? So I'll call this M sparse T and um, I'll copy these down to make uh, sparse C and R, C and R, okay? And I wanna predefine that. Uh, there's probably a better way that I could do all that. So we'll need to kind of create our getters for those sparse matrices, right? And so if we come back down here to the sparse uh, single, uh, we'll get three of these going. And so here we'll do M sparse T with the T, 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 R, 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 and then C, right? Yeah, C, 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 C. And I will come to the end of all my stuff here and I will then highlight and run all the code so that I know that all my functions are loaded, which is of course <laughs> very important. And again, we have that one E to the seven and then we've got 65,000 some kamers or rows and I think I defined uh, 4,000 possible genera. So those would be the, the columns, right? And so uh, to make sure that is run through. And so that now everything is loaded. Uh, it's so nice to have those faster versions of the sparse matrix um, builders. And so we now have um, these different uh, options for benchmarking. I'm going to go ahead and try to winnow down the things that I know aren't gonna work, right? Um, so this approach where we kind of built out the query programmatically, meh, uh, the in didn't work, uh, the or didn't work, um, but we have now have uh, these sparse versions with the three different approaches, right? So here are T, R, and C. Um, the, this vector is gonna be basically the same thing, but with the which, so that's where we'll get the vectors. All right, and so then the full three, uh, I'm a little bit worried that this one will blow up, but we'll see what happens. Remove the join because that was horribly slow. And then the DT, we'll also remove the DT3 without using the keys because that was quite a bit slower than using the keys, right? And so then um, we'll kind of do the same thing back up here. So these are all the single approaches. Um, make sure that I've got, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and remove this vector one vector single because we replace that with the witch and we need these sparse versions, again, the T, R, and the C. And then at the end, I'll do times equals 10. So normally times by default is 100, which makes it do 100 rep reps of each of the functions. I know this is gonna take longer because I've got 10 to the seven. I'll go ahead and set that down to 10. Um, and I think everything else should work. So we'll go ahead and run this and see what we get. So that ran through fairly quickly, which is good to see. Um, I'm getting this warning message about garbage, cl garbage collection using the DBI approach with uh, the DB whatever. <laughs> um, so again, obviously we see that using the full uh, square or rectangular matrix uh, performs the fastest as, as we've continued to see. Uh, the data table approaches using the keys are again quite fast with basically the same time to get one kamer as three kamers, which is really interesting. Uh, further back up here, we see the DT here, and oh, uh, where's the third, the three one? Oh, and I see up here uh, that, that I did drop it out. Anyway, it would have been slower probably than, than that, but we can see that DT is quite a bit slower than again, the DT with the index about three times slower, in fact. Um, the duck approaches are again, pretty fast for a database based approach. Uh, the DBI is um, here and we see the DBI three uh, taking about twice as long as the single. Um, so uh, I think the duck approach we're using the duck plier, <laughs> that's the difference, um, I think is probably the way to go for this size of data set, which is again, interesting. And then again, we see um, the, the sparse matrices using the R a compression approach or that representation um, performed better than the other sparse versions. Again, it's interesting here that using three or one kamer that you're trying to pull out perform just as fast. So again, this is more information. And I think what I'm learning comparing this with a much larger and sparser 
uh, data set. So not just the uh, number of KMERS that we're sampling matters, but the sparseness and kind of the overall size of the matrix we're trying to represent also matters. And so I know that I'm going to have to use this larger, more complicated uh, framework as we go for in testing things. Um, Again, this filtering is one part of working with a large data table. There's going to be other things like grouping things and um, doing math and manipulating columns and all sorts of things like that. And so I'm a little reluctant to pick one right now and roll with, say, data table, because it might be that duck single um, is faster in other ways that makes up for the slowness in something like a filter. Hopefully that makes sense. So I think what I'm going to do going forward is perhaps take a forked approach. And so we'll make a variety of branches on our project where we try different approaches. Maybe we'll try to see if we can make a full matrix work. I don't think it will, but we can try. We could also take a data table approach and we could also take a duck approach and we could also use a sparse as well as perhaps a data frame. And we might just, because we want to torture ourselves, we could also take a tibble based approach. So that's what we're gonna do in the next several episodes. And I think that will be really helpful to see how we can do the same type of data manipulation using these different types of representations of a data frame like object. So that you don't miss that episode, please make sure you've subscribed to the channel and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.